right, we are going to hop in to rev up um, building on what we talked about last week. So last week we talked about finding seller leads and setting up for your listing appointment. Today we're going to talk about that listing appointment and moving through that uh, listing to closed process. Um, I know we talked about in the buyer transactions that in one of those folders that was shared with you, there is a transaction um, action plan or flow. I don't remember what the spreadsheet's called, but there is one in there that you guys have access to that walks you through. In fact, let me pull it up for you. Hold on just a second. Everybody hang with me. Um, I want that. All right. Let's go find it. Hold on. I think it's going to be under working with buyers. And hold on. Transaction action plan. It's under the working with buyers folder. I'm sure Abby will probably put a copy of it into the, the working with um, sellers or winning listings one as well. But on here, there's two tabs. One of them, which we kind of talked about was the purchase tab for our buyer transactions. The other one is our listing tab. So you guys have access to this and this will kind of give you a general flow of the process of a listing. So we have the listing appointment, we have the pre-listing activities, then you have the active listing activities and then what happens once you get an offer and then under contract, everything that needs to take place. And then it takes you all the way down to what happens once that property is closed. So there's 112, it's probably actually closer to like 109 items on here because there's some blank lines in there and some titles, maybe 105, but there's a lot of things that have to happen during the listing process. So you guys have that, um, use it as a guide. That's you know under a perfect transaction, this is how it would flow along. Sometimes things are out of order. Or sometimes you skip things depending on the transaction. So just know that's kind of, the um the process and you can kind of use that to roll along in addition in case you're like amy what are those other columns well one is current owner new owner um so if you were once you are successful not if but once you are successful um and you're tired of being a single agent and you're ready to grow your team your first person you should add would be an ad a transaction coordinator technically you want to add that transaction coordinator in you can do that fairly quickly like within your first couple transactions, you can hire in that transaction coordinator that'll take care of all of the basic tasks associated with your listings and purchases, right? Uploading all those forms to Skyslope, making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, so on here, you'll see there's a list of TC type items. Um, I had a transaction coordinator that was my personal transaction coordinator. So she didn't do other people's files and she um, did a little bit more than just a regular transaction coordinator. Although I think most TCs now do this, like uploading the disclosures to Disclosures IO, which would now be home light listing management, um, you know, any price improvement paperwork, acknowledge any offers or counter offers, right? Just sending them a, a message to let them know we got it, moving those um, tags over from, you know, active to contingent. So all those on there. And then the next hire that you would want to make is an admin and your admin's going to take on this was specifically for like a transaction based admin taking on a bunch of those other tasks to set me free to lead generate so things like updating the database sending the seller contact to the transaction coordinator inputting the listing into the mls so all those things an admin can do so in case you're wondering hey amy what are those other two columns that's what those other two columns are so now you've had a good explanation on that so now <laughs> we'll hop back in so you can find that under the working with buyers folder that was shared with you, or Abby will probably put a copy of it into the seller file as well so that you guys can find that. Um, all right, back to our regularly scheduled presentation. <laughs> Give me just a second. It's loading, loading. All right. Winning the listing and negotiating the sale is what we're jumping into today. If anybody has any question, any questions, feel free to um, interrupt me at any time. Just unmute yourself. I don't have the chat window open. Let me see. Now I have the chat window open. I do have the chat window open, so I'll try to keep an eye on that as well. Um, but feel free just to interrupt. Say, hey, Amy, wait, I've got a question. 
Um, so here we go. Um, oh, before we jump in, we do only have like three more sessions of the actual rev up. We have um, today and tomorrow. And then we have next week, we have a tech training on Thursday where we're going to cover, we're supposed to cover going over the CMA report. So we'll probably cover that, but we may also loop in the listing agreement with that because I don't think we're going to get to it today. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then next week we have two rev ups, which finish our rev up series this time around. And then we end on Thursday with just an open Q and a before we all head off to summit the next week. And then, um, we'll get the new rev up back on the calendar for the following week after we return from summit. So just know that's coming. We're going to repeat these, but they'll be a little bit different because as you've noticed, I kind of fly by the seat of my pants and I've changed them all up anyway. So um, you never know what you're going to get. So pay attention to that. And then today at four, we have, um, we're going to cover those new forms um, from the car forms library that were released in December and the changes that were made. So I know that was a lot, but here we go. We're going to hop in now to our, learning objectives for winning the listing and servicing the listing. Um, we're gonna cover the listing appointment, tips for winning sellers and securing the listing, marketing and servicing the listing, negotiating the sale. Um, that's what we're covering today. So we're gonna hop in first to the listing appointment. So I don't know if you remember, but last week we talked about like the seven step seller process the listing presentation step four. So if in case you're like, Amy, it says step four, where's step one, two, and three? That was last week. You can catch that recording. It's on the YouTube channel um, or on the link that gets posted on the um, Rev Up class list. So um, step four is the listing presentation, right? We've secured the, the potential seller. We've set the appointment. We've gone through that pre-listing questionnaire so that we know that we're getting ready to sit down a ready, willing, and able seller. We've done research and preparation, and we've delivered that pre-listing package. Okay, so we've set ourselves up for success so that when we show up on the day of our appointment, all we have to do is get the listing agreement signed and continue to build that rapport and that relationship with the sellers. Um, when we first arrive at our listing appointments, um, we want to make sure that we follow a process for that listing appointment so that we're consistent and we make sure we, we get all the information that we need and that we, um, pay attention to all of the seller cues and the seller needs. Okay. Um, it can get broken into the seller listing appointment can get broken into four separate steps. The first would be the greeting and the outline of your presentation, right? That would be like what the owners can expect you to cover. The next step would be the home tour and connecting with the client. The third step would be the presentation, which would include pricing and marketing strategies. And then the last step in that four-step listing process would be closing for the listing and completing that listing paperwork. Okay, the RLA, the residential listing agreement. Um, I recommend that you time block appropriately on your calendar for listing appointments. I would probably, as a new agent, block an hour for the actual appointment. So if your appointment started at nine, I would block from nine to 10. I would probably plan to show up to their neighborhood about 15 minutes early, just so you can drive through the neighborhood and familiarize yourself with it if you aren't already familiar with their neighborhood. Okay, so make sure you give yourself time for that. You also want to make sure that you are never, ever late for a listing appointment that can cost you the listing. So make sure that you are a couple minutes early. You don't want to be super early because they might not be ready for you, but you also don't want to be late. And I highly recommend that after you complete that pre-listing questionnaire, you drop off that pre-listing packet. I recommend either on the morning of your appointment or the day before that you confirm the date and time of the appointment just to make sure everybody's still on the same page. Okay. Um, when you approach the front door, number one, make sure you arrive dressed professionally, right? We want to make, this is your first impression of getting in front of most clients. So we want to make sure that we dress the part um, and whatever that means to you, just make sure you portray what you're wanting to portray when you walk up to that front door. 
you're going to want to make some notes, whether they are mental or whether you whip out your phone and make a couple notes about the curb appeal of the property. Remember, the curb appeal is the first thing people see when they drive up to the property. It is also, which nobody talks about, the last thing people see when they walk away and drive away from that property. So it's super important to make sure you note the curb appeal so that you can make some suggestions if need be regarding the curb appeal. And it may be something simple like, hey, the bush along the walkway needs cut up because it are trimmed because it's hard to access the walkway or I hit it on my way up, right? Or we need to make sure we trim the edges of the grass, right? Little things like that. It may be that we need to add flowers to the front porch to add a pop of color, or maybe their front door needs a fresh coat of paint, especially those like security screens. Those always kind of look rusty and ratty. Um, so just make a note of anything relevant to the curb appeal. When you knock on the door, take a couple of small steps backwards. Don't fall off the step, please. But just take a couple of small steps back so that when they go to open the door, you're not standing right there in their face, right? Don't crowd the homeowners. Um, you want to make sure you greet the clients warmly and professionally. Um, and please make sure to offer to remove your shoes, even if they don't ask you to. It just shows respect for their home. Um, regardless of condition, even if you're walking and you're like, man, I don't want to walk around barefoot in this house, please don't walk barefoot, bring socks, okay? <laughs> bring some slippers. I don't really care, but offer to take your shoes off, okay? <laughs> Um, we want to make sure that we stay in control of the appointment, that we are the guiding force for this appointment. Um, if you ever lose control of the appointment, just redirect back with questions that will help put you back in control of that appointment. OK. Um, <laughs> you're going to write step one, greet them and the outline of your presentation. So just let them know when you get there, hey, I'm so happy to be here. Um, they may ask if you wanna take a seat, you can say, yeah, absolutely. Do you mind if we sit at the dining room table? If they don't have a dining room table, cause there's a lot of houses now that open concept, they have like a bar and then they have like a living room. Hopefully they've got a coffee table in the living room, but just ask, yeah, hey, do you mind if I set my stuff down? What I'd like to get started with today is a walkthrough of the property. Then we'll come back and um, meet and then talk about, um, you know, kind of the strategy to get your home sold, what that timing is going to look like for you, um, answer any questions that you might have, and then move forward with completing that listing paperwork, right? We're going to outline what's going to happen. Um, and we want to make sure that as we enter their home, that we're paying attention to the body language so that we can mirror and match our potential sellers. Okay, so if they are talking slow and cautiously, we want to be conscious of that, take some deep breaths. We want to slow our conversation down and we want to match that as well as the body language, right? If they're standing with their hands on their hips, maybe we want to come in and be like, hey, here's the plan for today, right? With our hands on our hips or, um, you know, whatever that might be. If we're crossing or they're crossing their arms, we want to come in and cross our arms, go through it and then slowly uncross your arms. It'll actually help them to uncross their arms and become um, less guarded. So we want to be aware of that and their styles. If they are a very direct person, we don't want to inundate them with a bunch of stories and small talk because you're probably annoying them versus somebody who wants to tell you about every little feature of their home. They probably like those stories and want you to go to further detail about every aspect of your life. So just pay attention. Okay. Um, the home tour you can utilize that to connect with the client. I really like, um, I don't feel like there's one wrong way or right way to do this. You can do it one of two ways. You can either do that home tour with the client. Just know it's going to take you a lot longer. They're going to want to talk about each and every room, go through all the features of the home. It's going to take you a little bit longer to get through that listing appointment. Or you can say, hey, what I would like to do is take a brief tour of the property um, and while I do that, there's a little tool in the winning listers folder that I created this morning that's called like the top 10 features. You can ask them, oh, it's the top favorite features of my home document. You can say, hey, what I would like to do is go tour the home as if I'm a buyer for the property. You won't be there to guide potential buyers through your house. And so I'd like to just kind of wander through the house like a potential buyer so I can see it through the buyer's eyes. While I'm doing that, I'm going to make some notes of things that maybe need to be changed or addressed before we go on the market. 
And while I work on that, if you wouldn't mind filling out this top 10 favorite features of my home document for me so that I understand what your favorite features are or things that I might miss when walking through it as a potential buyer, right? Ask them to like fill that out while you go do the walkthrough. Gives them something to do so they're not worried about what you're doing. Before you start that walkthrough, if you're doing it by yourself, just ask them, are there any rooms or anything? Is there anybody else home? that I need to be aware of before I walk into a room or am I free to go into any of the rooms or open doors? And they'll either say yes or no, right? Then you're gonna go do that walkthrough. I usually open up my phone at that point with my notes app and I take notes as I walk through the property. The bed in the bedroom needs to get pulled away from the wall. There's seven dressers in that room. We need to clear out some of the clutter. The closets are jam packed. I need to address that with them, right? So I'm gonna make notes about what I would mention to them um, as if we were getting ready to go on the market right away. You can also make notes as to things that maybe should be done before you go on the market. Um, you know, if there's minor repairs or issues that need to be addressed, right? Carpet's torn in the bathroom. Let's just replace it with vinyl instead of carpet, uh, right? Little things like that. So hallway, maybe put a rug over it, whatever it might be. Um, so you're going to make notes that you can provide them with after they sign that listing agreement. Okay, um, you also want to, as you walk through their home, you want to make mental notes of what you're seeing that pertains to the sellers, right? We're looking to build relationship with them and rapport. So you're gonna look at the pictures on the walls. You're gonna look at what they've got going on in bedrooms. Do you have things in common? Their kids have soccer balls in their bedrooms and your kids also play soccer. Does it not look like they have any kids? It looks like they're empty nesters. You're also an empty nester, right? We're going to try to find things that are that we have in common with them. Do they have a sauna in their bedroom and you've always wanted one? Whatever that might be, right? Look for those things and make notes so that you can have, when you're done with that tour, you can have those conversations with them to build relationship and build rapport. Okay, any questions about the home tour? Okay. No, ma'am. Fabulous. Once you're done with the home tour, if you've had them fill out that top 10 home features, right? You probably want to go over that with them. You just want to have a conversation. Oh, you know, I made some notes of things that maybe we could, um, we can talk about as we get closer to the on market date of things that we would want to change or move around or, you know, declutter some areas. So I can go over that with you later. Can you please walk me through what your 10 favorite features are, what the favorite features of your home are with me, right? And then you can be like, oh yeah, that's really cool. I didn't even realize, you know, the solar panels must be on the back. If they're like, oh yeah, we have solar and it covers 100% of our power every year. It's amazing. You can be like, oh, that's great. Because walking up to the house, I didn't see the panels. And obviously it's something that you're touring the house, you're not going to see. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to talk about that. That's also a good opportunity to ask them if it's paid off, right? Or um, if there's a payment on it, all those different things. And an opportunity to, to let them know that they should present their true up bill as part of the listing so that people can see that it covers 100% of their PG&E bill, right? Um, so you're just going to go through that features list with them. And then you're going to go through your marketing strategies. Okay, this is a good time for you just to... I. I wouldn't spend too much time talking about yourself and it depends on your sellers. So again, we have to be paying attention to cues, body language, trying to identify what kind of personality type they are and how in depth they want you to go with talking about yourself. Um, but the majority of sellers really are more concerned with how are you gonna market the property and how are you gonna get it sold? As part of that, we wanna make sure that we ask them questions that lead us to understand their motivation for selling, their timeline for selling, which we should have gotten through that pre-listing questionnaire, but we may want to reiterate those things so that we make sure we have a clear understanding of what they're looking for and looking at um, with regards to those items. Um, and let's see here. You, um, they may want you to dive right into that marketing, not just the marketing strategy, but what price they should list the home. And so you want to make sure you go through kind of your value proposition first and your marketing strategy and get to kind of cover what your plan is for the property and for the listing. Um, so you can set that up for success at the beginning to stay in control of that conversation, right? So they don't continue to take it along to the price. Um, a good script for that or a good dialogue for that is, 
you know, hi, Mr. and Mrs. Whatever. Um, you don't have to start with hi because you've already introduced yourself. You just be like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Blank. Um, I want to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to work for you. I know that you have many choices for real estate professionals, and I don't take that knowledge lightly. In fact, no doubt you are anxious to learn the results of my marketing research, and I will get into that right away. If you will indulge me, I would like to take a couple of minutes first just to review your hiring criteria, along with the review um, of my qualifications. Would that be okay? right? So you're saying, hey, can I do this first? And then we'll dive into that, right? So you're setting that expectation up that allows you to kind of go through what they're looking for in an agent, right? As well as um, what qualifications you have that meet those needs. Okay. You want to make sure um, to be on your, to think on your feet, and you want to try to address any concerns or thoughts or hiring needs that they have there on the spot. So um, as part of the pre-listing questionnaire, it asks what's important in choosing a real estate professional. If you haven't gone over that yet, now is a good time to do that. You could say, what is important to you with hiring a real estate professional, right? Super easy question. We just ask it there on the spot. If you've already covered that, then you can go into the, when I asked what was important to you in choosing a real estate professional, you said that you want someone who communicates with you on a regular and timely basis, right? Whatever their answers were, you're going to go over them with, with, over that with them. And that means frequent updates on activities, showings, and feedback from buyers and the agents, correct? So we're going to take whatever their criteria was. We're going to address how that meets that criteria and ask them to agree with us. Right. That gives them the opportunity to say, well, I also would like this. Right. You also said that you want a professional. And to you, that means someone with polish expertise in the industry and someone who can speak and write well. Is that correct? Right. So we're just clarifying those items. Something else you mentioned was getting a step by step assistance with the paperwork and help throughout the escrow closing phase of a transaction. Right. Is there anything else that you thought of that is important to you? Right. And all these questions can be asked as part of that pre-listing appointment to make sure that you're a good match before you even walk through the door or to make sure that you have those answers um, ready to go before you walk through the door. If there's anything else that's important to them, you're going to make quick note of it and make a decision of whether it's something that can be addressed at the appointment or whether it's something that you need to delay on and get back to them with. And you're going to let them know if it's something that you're going to delay. OK. Um, then you're going to outline your experience in the industry or your experience with, um, you know, the process in general. Um, even if you're new to real estate, you can highlight how you bring integrity, enthusiasm, um, your personality to the transaction, right? And you can always um, rely on the backing of your mentors as well. If you're new in the industry, you can also leverage the wealth of knowledge and the expertise that we have in the office as well. So just know it's however you decide to spin that story is, is what's going to help propel you forward, right? So if you're like, man, I'm day one and I booked a listing appointment. Now I'm showing up to this. You may not want to be, oh, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, this is day one in the industry, but you may want to highlight the fact that Realty One Group has, you know, 127 agents with over, you know, a combined, you know, 400 years of, of expertise, right? Or whatever that is. So figure out how you want to leverage that. Um, every seller is going to be different and have different hot buttons and needs, right? So when we previewed and when we went through that pre-listing questionnaire, we asked questions about you know, what's important to them. So we really want to hang on to those things that are important to the seller, their motivation, and what's going to cause them to make a decision on one agent versus another. You're going to tailor your presentation um, to address those desires and concerns. Okay. Does that make sense? It's nice. That I can see Heather's head nodding. I'm just imagining everybody else's heads are nodding. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> when we walk through this process, um, when we're talking about marketing strategies, we want to help the seller think like a buyer, okay? Sellers are emotionally attached to their homes, right? That's where they've raised their kids. That's where they spent the last few years. Even if they hate their home, they still love their home because it has memories there, 
Okay. The only ones that may not, or somebody that's in the middle of a nasty divorce, they may not have an emotional attachment to their home. Even then they're going through an emotional ordeal. So it's going to be emotional for them. So we want to help them think like a buyer, right? That's why we walked through their home through the buyer's eyes. Okay. Um, once we talk about kind of our marketing strategy, then we're going to come up with those pricing strategies, right? So we want to make sure that we discuss the months of inventory, the present competition, the present condition of the property, um, so that we're kind of going through that before we even get to the price. We're going to lead them along to that price range that we want them to be in before we get there. So it might be a good idea, right, to bring comps. I like the one page report or maybe some additional photos of some of the comparable properties so that they can see that, hey, number one, you know, there's two and a half months of inventory on the, the market and the average days on market right now is 32 days, right? Whatever it might be, we wanna make sure that we have that available and ready to go. We also want to talk about um, whether it's a buyer's market versus a seller's market and how buyers pick homes, right? So if we're comparing two properties and one has updates and one doesn't, buyers are going to be more likely to turn to the, the home with updates if they're priced the same or even how buyers choose neighborhoods, right? So we want to talk about which homes are in direct competition with them. So in addition to just comps, we want to talk about like, here's all the active listings that would be considered direct competition. And usually what you would use for direct competition are going to be homes in similar type neighborhoods that are a couple hundred square feet smaller to a couple hundred square feet bigger. Okay, that's what they're looking at. A buyer that's looking at a 1600 square foot home is probably looking at like a 1500 square foot home to like an 1800 square foot home. And they're probably looking at all of those all through the city of Vacaville. So instead of focusing on price necessarily, when we pull what the competition is, we're going to be looking at size or we're going to be looking at features of the property, right? Which ones have pools, which one doesn't if there's as a pool. So we want to make sure that we're thinking about that and thinking like a buyer does and thinking if a buyer was going to look at this home, what other homes in the entire city are they looking at? So that we have the wide range of price ranges ready to go and comps. Okay. Um, present the competition, the listing process, right? We talk about um, once, once you guys look at those, let me back up a slide if it'll let me. Oh, here we go. All right. So once you guys kind of look at the competition, we talk about kind of market it is, then we're going to kind of give your buyers a price range. It's a really effective way to take like a blank piece of paper, right? Imagine, oh, look, I have a full sheet of paper right there, right? Take the full sheet of paper. You can even be like, hey, so the properties we looked at fell in the range from, you know, 500,000 to 650,000, right? And we talked about those ones in that $650,000 price range. Those are the ones that are fully updated in those really fancy neighborhoods. Those are the ones that fall in that range versus the ones over here that need a lot of work. Um, you know, they're not as nice as your property. The neighborhoods aren't as nice. So your property is really going to fall kind of right here in the middle, you know, maybe at that 575 mark, right? So we're just going to kind of pinpoint and be like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, does that make sense to you? And they'd be like, Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. And we may even give them a range. Like we may say, Hey, it's like 560 to 575, right? Visual is nice because people are a lot of times visual learners and that helps them understand like, okay, yeah, we looked at those homes that were much nicer than ours. And yeah, you were right. Those were listed way up here. And we looked at those that weren't as nice as ours listed down here. And yeah, I do think ours falls somewhere in the middle of those. And okay, now I get a range like 560, 575. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. Yes, right? So we're asking them to get on board with us by doing that and the visual helps, okay? Um, once we fall into a range, then we're gonna talk about this process and we can even bring a graph like this. In fact, like Cloud CMA has one that talks about where to list it versus not. Um, and this talks about, right? Like market values in the middle, 
and the percent of buyers who are going to look at that property. So properties that are market value get 60%. If they're listed a little below market value, you've got 75% of the potential buyer pool looking at them. 15%, you got 90%, right? 10 percent over the market value, we've eliminated a lot of buyers that are willing to look at that property. And if we list it well over the market value at 15% over in relation, then we're only going to get 10% of the market share. Okay. So you can always be like, hey, at a glance, can you tell me which price range is the best fit for your property? Right. So we can ask that. We can have um you know, kind of where they want to price it, market value over under, right? So we can have conversations with them. Regard Our ultimate goal is to have our sellers choose the price because that's what's going to help them be happy with the price that we go on the market at, okay? And um, you can always let them know a good little blurb to share with them is I can guarantee what your, that your home will sell. I just can't guarantee the price. All I can do is take all the market data and put it together and then choose a starting point that we're both comfortable with and go from there, right? Ultimately, the buyers are going to tell us what your property is worth. Does that make sense? And you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense, right? Um, we can also show them that the listing price of time on market. So, right. So if we talked about this price range of 560 to 575, right. And we talk about making sure we want to price it in a way that it's not going to sit on the market very long, because as we look at the time on market, the weeks on market, it's going to reduce their sales price, the longer it sits, right. So if we get showings right away, I expect about 10 per week. And within two weeks, if there aren't any offers, then it means that we're only about 5% off your asking price. Close, but no cigar, as they say. If we get only a few or no showings, however, that means that we're significantly off what the buyer would consider market value, right? Now, that doesn't apply to the luxury home market. Just so everybody knows that's a whole different ball game when you start looking at like the Cheyenne homes or even potentially country properties where they're that much higher price range. Um, you can let the sellers know, right? The greatest activity from motivated, qualified buyers uh, occurs within the first 30 days of putting your home on the market. After that, the pro property um, becomes worn or stale. And most of the serious buyers now know about it. They know about it or they've seen it. And we found that the longer the property sits on the market, the lower its ultimate sales price would be. So this graph kind of illustrates that point, right? So you could always take a graph like this with you as well. Ultim and ultimately, if we follow that first one, right, if we get showings right away, I expect 10 per week. If we price it, appro I would go with if we price it appropriately, I expect about 10 showings per week. And within the first two weeks, if we don't see any offers, it does mean that we're priced a little on the high side that we're the market's shifting a little bit. Does that make sense? Right. And so if we go for a week with only a few or no showings, we probably need to talk about doing a price adjustment to set ourselves up for success because we don't want that property sitting on the market longer than you know a month or a month and a half, whatever the current days on market is. Okay. Um, so as part of that, you'd say, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, what do you think a good list price would be if they're like, well, you know, based on those two things that you told me that, you know, if we price it below, we're going to open it up to more buyers and we don't want that property sitting on the market as well as we're pretty motivated to get it sold. So I think we should price it, you know, close to that 560 number. You'd be like, great. I think that's an excellent decision, right? If they're like, man, I know that you said 560 to 575, but I really want to price it at 590. Then we can go back to the comps or we could have a conversation about Mr. and Mrs. Seller. If we're talking about wanting to list it at 590, that's well above where the similar properties have sold. And not only do we have to justify it to a buyer, but once the buyer enters into contract on your property, we also have to justify it to an appraiser. And I'm just afraid at 590,000 that we're not going to get um, the appraiser to be on board with us for that value. And I really think we need to be closer to that 560 to 575 range. And if they don't agree with you, you have two choices. Number one, you can take the listing at a price that's way too high and you know is going to sit on the market and not sell. And then you're ultimately going to follow this graph with price reductions down to where it's probably going to sell less than 560,000. Or 
you can tell Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I appreciate your time, energy, and effort. However, um, I don't feel like I can meet your expectations. My goal is to get your price, your home sold and at 590,000, I just don't feel like the market supports that right now. So I'm going to decline from taking this job for you because I don't want to fail on your expectations, right? And then they're either going to make a decision of, gosh, they were really serious about the list price and we either need to change it or they'll be like, okay, no problem. We'll go with somebody else, right? But if you're going to list a property that ultimately they're going to end up unhappy with because it's going to sit for 45 days before it gets an offer and you're going to end up you know, listed down at 555, then we're setting them up for that at the beginning rather than chasing their expectations down the toilet. Does that make sense to everybody? You don't have to take every listing. Heather, were you going to say something? Trying, but my stupid thing is flickering. <laughs> I was like, is it off or on? Is it off or on? Um, yeah, I was gonna ask. Um, I like before I got into real estate, I had heard um that people would do appraisals, like some people would do them up front. Do you think that's a good idea? No, okay. I don't, unless you've got a very unique property that there's nothing else like it. And it's almost impossible to comp out. You don't just want to throw a dart at a board and try to stab something at it. Um, I would not have an appraisal done. The reason for that is appraisers come in and give an opinion of the value. Mm -hmm. And appraisers tend to be more accurate if they have a, a, a center dot that they're aiming for than if you don't have anything out there. So they tend to be a little bit more conservative on just like, Hey, can you come do an appraisal of my property versus, Hey, we're in contract at 580,000. Okay. Can you see if you can get there? Right. Right. So that's why I generally don't do that. Unless I said, unless you've got like a super unique property, then it might be worth having it. The other problem with an appraisal too, is that sellers rely way too heavily on those when they have them done ahead of time. And so if I have an appraisal that comes in at 575, then they're going to want to list it at 575. And if we talk about price reduction, they'll be like, but we have an appraisal that said it was worth 575. You'd be like, well, the val the buyers say otherwise. And it's going to have, you're going to have a harder time fighting that battle with them because they have this, what they feel like is an official document, even though it's just somebody else's opinion of the value, right? It's no more accurate than your opinion of the value ultimately. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. When we go to ask for the listing, we want to make sure that we are patient, that we ask questions, that we make sure that we encourage questions and encourage discussion, and that we make sure we include the seller in the decision-making process, right? The seller needs to be included in what the price range is going to be or what that listing price is going to be that goes on that contract. They need to be involved in the decision-making process of the on-market date. We need to know what their time frame looks like. Um, we want to make sure that we've handled all of their objections before we ask them to sign the listing agreement. Okay, so be patient. Don't rush the process. Um, by the time you get to the point where you're going to ask for the listing, right, you have already reviewed their motivation, their timings, their concern, and their criteria, right? We talked about that in step one. We've discussed your qualifications, market info, buyers, and competition. We did that in step two. We presented the market supply research, right? Your um, your uh, CMA or your market analysis of their property, um, the price range availability and comparable homes for sale. So at this point, what you want to do is you want to secure the agreement based on the best price range, right? Um, you're going to, you've already presented your target market plan and you've answered and handled all questions and objections. When secured agreement, it doesn't mean you've actually got it signed. It just means that everybody's in agreement on what that list price is going to be. Okay. Then we're going to move forward to close the listing. We are going to ask for the business, right? Sellers are looking for go-getters. They're looking for someone that's assertive with a can-do fearless attitude. And we're going to demonstrate that we possess those qualities and more, right? And we can go for the soft close. And you're like, Amy, what does that mean? We're going to ask them questions that get yes answers before we ask them to sign the listing agreement. Okay. Um, 
right? So you could say, um, number one, you can reiterate some of their time frames. Perfect. So we're going to put the on market date as, you know, February 28th, correct? And they're, you're going to shake your head yes when you say correct. And they're going to say, yep, that's right. And we've agreed that the sales price is going to be $572,500, correct? Yep, that's accurate. Perfect. And I'm really excited about getting, about helping you get your home sold. And I'm confident we will be successful. Are you ready to get your home on the market now so that we can get you into your new home in Little Rock, Arkansas soon, right? <laughs> Heather liked that. It's not funny. I have sellers moving to Little Rock. <laughs> no, I literally talked to the guy at Verizon. He was telling me all about that area yesterday. He lives there. Yeah, don't move there. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, right. So we're going to reiterate what their motivation is. Where do they want to go? Right. So we can get you to your ho new home near your grandbabies. Right. We want to reiterate what that motivation is. And you'd be like, yeah, I do. I want to, I want to get my home sold so that I can move next to my grandbabies, or I want to get my home sold so that I don't have to clean a 3000 square foot home anymore. Right. If they're doing a sale and then they're like downsizing. So whatever that motivation is, we want to reiterate that and get them to agree with us on that. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to complete the listing paperwork and obtain the signatures. Dun, dun, dun. I highly recommend that you fill out the listing paperwork in advance as much as possible, right? All your information can already be on that form. The seller's names can already be on that form, the address, the APN, all that stuff can already be on the form. The things that might not be on the form are going to be the actual on market date, right? Or the listing price. But that really should be about it. Commission can already be filled out on the form. Any other non-crucial paperwork can be handled electronically. Okay, so um, personally with my pre-listing packet, I'm gonna give them a copy of the listing agreement. I'm gonna give them a copy of the market conditions advisory. I'm gonna give them a copy of the disclosure information advisory a copy of the statewide buyer and seller agreement and copies of the TDS and the SPQ, that transfer disclosure statement and the seller property questionnaire. I have no intention of them filling out those forms. At the listing appointment, I'm just gonna bring the listing paperwork, the agency disclosure, because they've already seen the other forms, okay? If they hadn't seen the other forms already, I would have more concern about them before they sign that paperwork to make sure that they understand what's on that market conditions advisory and what's on that disclosure information advisory. So I may include those if I hadn't gotten them pre-listing paperwork because I want them to understand that before we sign on the listing price. Okay, if you've got a seller, before we go any further, if we've got a seller, I'm not sure if it covers this next or not. Oh, it does, we're on the next slide. All right, never mind. Um, if you've got a seller that wants to list it too high or you're in a market where you're consistently seeing longer days on market and you may need to do some price reductions, we've already prepped them for this in advance because we had that conversation of when we go on market, my expectation is that we're going to have showings on the property. To know that we showed it appropriately, I would expect somewhere between seven to 10 showings per week, right? If our showings fall below that, then that means that we're not listed appropriately and we may need to make an adjustment on our listing price to pull more buyers in. So if we may want to go ahead and write in those price reductions after two weeks on market, we would do a $5,000 price reduction if, the, if we've had fewer than 14 showings in two weeks, right? On week four, we're gonna do an automatic price reduction to blank, right? So we would already have that and we can have the conversation with them. It would sound something like this. <clears throat> we would agree that 572,500 should be the initial asking price. If we do not have at least 10 showings in the first two weeks, do I have your agreement to adjust the price to 570,000, right? I might bring it down to a round number at that point because I wasn't good enough to get the round number at the beginning. I highly recommend listing at round numbers. Don't do random numbers because um, if you've got somebody that's in the price range of 500 to 570,000 and you've got somebody that's in a price range from 570,000 to 650 and you listed at 572, you've eliminated those people that cut off at 570. Rarely ever does a lender say, hey, you're pre-approved Heather <laughs> for a loan up to 573,000. <laughs> 
right? We just don't say that. It's always round numbers. So I highly list, I highly recommend listing at those round numbers so you catch either end of the cutoff because people as real estate agents, we put people in their own property searches at round numbers. We don't do random 999 numbers, okay? So do round numbers. So I highly recommend that if they were like, man, 572, 500, I would explain to them that rationale and said, let's do you mind listing it at 570,000? They're gonna be like, oh yeah, that makes total sense because I'm eliminating people with that 200, with that $2,000. Yes, you are, right? <laughs> so we would adjust it down. It doesn't have to be a drastic price reduction, but it needs to be something so it shows back up on people's radar screens. I highly recommend if we hit that round number that we reduce it like every kind of two weeks at a $5,000 increment or more. I probably wouldn't go less than $5,000 um, only because that hits you to that next kind of round number where somebody's gonna gonna shave off that search. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, um, they talk about the magic number, right? So you can use this in your speech as well, right? So we talked about, hey, we've agreed that 570,000 should be the initial list price. If we do not have at least 10 showings in the first two weeks, so I have your agreement to adjust the price to 565,000. It doesn't need to be drastic, um, you know, just a little bit. Think of it like something that goes on sale. It always attracts us as consumers, right? Yeah, we all love a sale. And since the actual selling price will come down to what a buyer is willing to pay and what you are willing to take, we can only adjust the price a little at a time until we hit that magic number. Let me explain, okay? Um, just so you guys know, I can give you a copy of this uh, dialogue as well. Um, so I'll put it onto a document after we finish up here today and we'll put that document in that winning the listing so that you have these scripts with you to be able to utilize. It may actually be, there's actually like a uh, guide for this lesson. So I'll see if it's in there as well. The magic number is not the selling price. It is the asking price at which a buyer feels, right? So we left off at, um, we can only adjust the price a little at a time until we hit the magic number. Let me explain. The magic number is not the selling price. It is the asking price at which a buyer feels comfortable making an offer. You will notice that I have written in your listing agreement that the price will be automatically reduced by $5,000 every two calendar weeks, but it will not go below blank, right? So it will not go below $550,000. Will that work for you? Whatever their bottom is, we probably already had a conversation with them, so we understand kind of where their bottom line is. It's a good idea to have that understanding from the beginning. It may be $560,000, right? Whatever that is. Will that work for you? Right. And you may need to reassure and remind the sellers that you do not want to leave change on the table. Right. So um, you may need to review your target marketing and marketing plan. Like, hey, my goal is to not do a price reduction. That's why we talked about what price, what the the best price is to go on the market at. And just remember, like when we hit the market, number one, you know, I can list, I can market your property as a coming soon. So I'll be sending out flyers to all the neighborhoods as well as a few other target demographics that might be interested in your home. I will also be sending out, um, we'll be doing open houses those first two weekends on the market to make sure that we get as many buyers through your property as possible that may be interested in it. Remember, we don't have to remind them that 1% of homes sell by open houses and we're really doing it for Legion. We can let them know that it's going to be marketing. We're going to put a sign in the yard. So anybody who's passing by that's like, man, I really want to live in this neighborhood, knows your home's coming for sale and is for sale and can call us and contact us to be able to see that property as well as we do social media marketing and we promote it to other areas that, um, you know, this is a move a neighborhood that they would move to. So like the Bay area that we're finding more and more people don't have to commute to work since the COVID epidemic, they can work from home more days a week. They like to, you know, move where they can get more for their money up here. So we'll advertise to those people as well. Does that make sense? My goal is to get your home sold, right? And they're gonna be like, okay, that works. Yeah, every two weeks, it makes sense to reduce it. And yeah, 560, that's really our bottom line. We're gonna start at that 570 number or 575 or whatever we're starting with. And yeah, okay. Yeah, that's kind of our bottom line. We are anxious to get it sold. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? That conversation that we're going to have with them. And then it makes sense to have those pre-designated price reductions in your contracts. We haven't had to worry about that because the market's been so hot up until the last six months, 
right? You put a home on the market, didn't matter what you listed it at, somebody was going to make an offer on it. I mean, unless you were just like way out of whack, but for the most part, somebody was going to make an offer. So now we're in a part where it's going to sit a little bit longer. Number one, we need to set that expectation with our sellers that our average days on the market is blank so that we set the expectation up front and that we make sure that they know, they know our goal is to get that property sold as quick as possible. And part of doing that is pricing it appropriately and then pairing that with our marketing. All right. Once you get that listing and it's signed and done. Now, if you've got somebody who is um, hesitant to sign the listing agreement because they have additional appointments, it's probably because they don't want to call the other agents and tell them that they've already made their choice. Okay. So if you've got somebody, it's like, well, we have a couple of other appointments scheduled and you can be like, is there anything that I said today that would prevent you from wanting me to sell your property for you? Well, no, like your marketing plan was pretty good. We came to an agreement on a price. I appreciate that you were upfront and honest with me. Perfect. Who else do you have appointments with? I'm happy to call those people up and cancel those appointments for you. You would do that for me? Yeah, absolutely. I don't want you to have to call those agents and let them know that you've already selected someone. So I'm more than happy to let them down gently. Right? Do that for them. Take the reins. Cancel it. Goodbye. Adios. Right? Our goal is, right, like, Okay, I don't want to relate you to a car salesman. However, if somebody walks on a car lot and they don't buy a car, they walk away, the chances of them ever coming back become very slim and none. Car salesmen know this, right? As real estate agents, we seem not to realize this, but if we walk into a listing appointment, we don't get the listing signed. The second we walk out that door, our chances of getting that listing agreement signed drop drastically. Okay, we want to take control of that and we want them to sign that listing agreement. That's why it's always good. I know you like electronic signatures. It's way easier to send things out electronically. It's harder to figure out how to print something. You got to go to the office. You don't have your own printer and like print it up. So it takes more work and effort, but print up that listing agreement and take it with you and get it signed. Okay, then you're in agreement. All right. Once you get that listing agreement signed, then um, we want to make our sellers part of our team. Okay. So we want to have them collect cards for us, right? Hey, most agents, when they show the property, they leave a card behind. Can you make sure just to leave a little stack? And then, you know, every few days I'll come by and I'll, you know, get the update. And if you want, you can send me a picture, right? You could say, hey, after the showings, like when people leave their cards behind, can you send me a picture of each of those cards? And then you can go ahead and chuck them in the trash can. Right now they're like, oh, good. She cares about who came through the property. We already know who came through the property, but it makes them feel like they're part of it, right? If you use a flyer box, I don't like flyer boxes, but if you use flyer box, you can enlist the help of the seller. Although I feel like if you enlist the help of the seller too much, they don't feel like you're doing their, your job. So if they're like, if you're like, hey, can you let me know when it's nearly empty, like the flyer box? Then they're like, they're not even checking on the flyer box. What exactly are they doing, right? Or you could be like, hey, every like three to four days, I'm going to drive by. I'm going to double check that the sign's still standing, that everything looks good, that there's flyers still in the box. But if you happen to notice the flyers are emptying out sooner than, you know, like maybe you're like, hey, I'm going to come by every Monday, Wednesday or Monday, Thursday, right? And if you happen to notice them emptying out before, then just let me know. I'll come by an extra time, right? That way we set the expectation of when we're going to be checking that and enlisting their help in that to say, hey, if you notice it before or after that, like it's emptying before those days, just let me know. I'll come by and add some extra flyers. Super simple. We've set the expectation. They know we're doing our job, but we've also enlisted them to help us. We've made them part of the team. Okay. Um, I would encourage set the expectation for your sellers to leave the property 15 minutes before any scheduled showings. However you decide to schedule showings is up to you. I like to use showing time because it puts my sellers in charge of their own showings. They're not interacting with the agents or the potential buyers, but they don't have to use me to schedule their showings, which brings me joy and happiness because it gives me more time to do things that are going to continue to grow my business like lead gen. Um, but you can use whatever you want. Um, but I would instruct your seller to plan to be gone 15 minutes before the showings and to plan to stay gone for plan that they're going to be at the house for 45 minutes. Okay. 
So each showing is going to be about an hour. Even though if I were scheduling the showings, I would stack them at every 30 minute increments. Okay. Um, just because I don't want my seller interacting with agents and I don't want them interacting with buyers. Sellers get chatty. We may also address that with our sellers and say, hey, at any time, if somebody arrives early or you're a little later getting out of the house, like just be short and cordial with anybody you encounter. Like, don't feel like you've got to answer any questions for them. We don't want, we want to make sure that we don't give them more information than what's necessary in order to negotiate a good deal for your property. Does that make sense? And I'd be like, okay, that makes sense. Right. I have sellers that show up and they like, oh, the TV. Yeah. Maybe we can leave the TV or this or that or the other. And then you've got buyers at the end of the transaction going, well, the seller said they were going to leave the TV. And I'm like, well, it wasn't in your contract. So they took it. Right. So <laughs> don't let them talk with each other. It's bad. It's bad. Also, what happens is the seller, right? I talked about them making an emotional decision. Um, sellers fall in love with buyers because they want the buyers to have the same experience in the house they did. And they want the perfect buyers for their neighbors. And this is a business decision. That's why they hired us. So we want to keep that separate so they don't become emotionally attached to any of the buyers. All right. Um, you're going to make sure that you collect feedback. That's one of the reasons I like showing time is it solicits for feedback. I can share it directly through the app with my, my sellers. Um, if they don't give feedback through the app, then you better believe that I'm going to be on the phone with them collecting feedback. Oftentimes after showing, I'm going to text them and say, Hey, what'd your buyers think? Right. Um, don't defend the listing or the price, right? We're just going to report. Okay, so we're going to report this all back to the sellers and be cautious about the info you really you reveal to potential um, buyers, agents or buyers. OK, we only want to give them enough. We're going to say, is this going to help or hinder your sellers? OK, so right off the gate, we don't want to be like, oh, yeah, well, my sellers told me that I could tell you there's some room for negotiation in the price. Don't tell them that up front like that doesn't help you try to go for a full price offer. Um, so, um, let's see, we addressed that. Okay. So I think we addressed that. I would set, um, I would set the expectation with your sellers too, of when you're going to provide feedback. Otherwise they're going to call you after every showing all hours of the day, all days of the week. So you can let them know that, Hey, we've got an open house and, you know, it's our first weekend on the market. So, um, we're going to kind of let the dust settle. I'm going to collect all the feedback and I'll give you a report on Tuesday. Right. So by Tuesday at 10 a.m., you'll have a report from me on kind of what all the feedback was and how the weekend showings went. Is that fair? And they're gonna be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Right. So we're going to set that expectation up front so that they're not expecting every time somebody shows our property, to, their property for us to pick up the phone and call them with feedback. Right. It's important to preset expectations so you don't fail on expectations that weren't set. Um, contact those showing agents for feedback. Oh, we talked about this already. All right. We're going to move forward. When you finally get an offer, what usually happens before you get an offer is an agent calls you and they're like, my buyers, they really love the property. They're going to write an offer. And then you're like, yay. And you call the seller and they're like, hey, I just talked with an agent. We're going to get an offer. And then like three days pass and there's no offer because agents, you know, have the best intentions in mind, but sometimes their buyers think they're going to write and then they end up not writing because they look at that payment and they're like, oh my gosh, I thought we were approved up to that, but never mind, I need to adjust my sales price or whatever it might be, right? So until we actually have a physical offer in hand, we do not say anything to our sellers. Please do not say anything to your sellers until you have an offer in hand. Okay? Don't do it. I promise you'll, you'll regret it at some point in your life. Um, you can present the offers two ways. One is in person or one is electronic. I usually ask my sellers what they prefer. Okay, if there's only one offer that comes through, it's not that hard. We could go over that over the phone. I can email them all the summary of the offer along with a copy of it and we can go over it over the phone, but sometimes they prefer to go over it in person. Kind, of, It usually depends too on their personality type, right? Those high C's versus the high D's and what they like. Um, and sometimes it depends on our personality type too, but you need to let go of that. Remember, it's not about us. It's about them. So what do they want and what do they need? It's not about what we need, even though we feel like it'd be better to go over it in person. If they could take electronic. You're going to save yourself some time. Um, and you may want to provide a net sheet for the offers received. 
Um, in the folder that I'll go over before we're done. Oh, it's 12 o'clock. I'm sorry. We're going to go a little bit over. We're almost done though. Um, <laughs> in the folder that will get shared with this, uh, this um, recording, there is a side-by-side -side offer re um, review form where if you get multiple offers in, you can put the details of each offer in there and it gives them a side-by-side -side comparison. It, um, and it's set up for the new residential purchase agreement that came out two Decembers ago. So it's in the order that you'll find it in that grid, which makes it really easy to fill out the details. And then there's a little place at the bottom for you to add any extra information. And that's usually where I fill in, like, here's how I would counter this offer. Here are some notes that I have, or here are some concerns with this offer, right? So it has the ability to be able to do that. Please don't ever present offers, letter offer, letter offer letters to your sellers. Okay, number one, in our residential listing agreement, when we go over it, you'll see that there's a box that you have to check if you're going to present letters, otherwise you're not supposed to, um, I think is how it reads. Um, but it makes it, it goes back to that emotional decision. We're trying to keep it a business decision, not an emotional decision. And the second you start sharing buyer letters, it becomes emotional. Now, after we've chosen an offer, when I send it over to my sellers for signatures, I do include the letter with it. If the buyers included a letter, at that point, I'm okay with letting the sellers know who's buying their house if they want to see it. All right. Um, I've never in the 17 years that I've done real estate, um, I've never had a buyer agent ask to present the offer in person with me. It could happen. It's legally allowed to happen. I've never had one. So if that happens, then it would be a call to the seller and say, hey, the buyer would like their agent to present the offer in person. How do you feel about that? Do you want that to happen or not? And if the seller says no, then you can get back to the other agent and be like, sorry, my seller says no, please send it over electronically. Right. Um, <clears throat> you want to learn scripts for presenting less than perfect offers. It does happen. Sometimes we get offers that are less than perfect. So there's dialogue for that right? We're not going to try to withhold the information or sugarcoat it. We're not going to try to make it seem better than it is, right? But it may be something like the offer is not full price. As I told you, most likely be the case. It does appear to be a strong offer. However, we'll go over the entire offer when we are together, discuss options and how we'll answer the buyer, right? So really easy script there. If you've already prepped them, they're like, man, I want to list it up here. You'd be like, yeah, that's cool. But you may get offers below asking. Um, so, right, we've already prepped them for that. If the offer is really a low ball offer or it contains unrealistic terms, right? Then you could say something like, I'm afraid the offer is rather off the mark. However, the buyers went through the trouble of putting together in writing. So let's give them the courtesy of an answer. I'll look forward to seeing you at 5 p.m. where we'll talk about how we respond, right? I always recommend that you counter offer. Even if you counter offer back at list price, like at least, at least play ball, okay? Um, think about how you would feel if you were in the buyer's or their agent's shoes, a flat out rejection or having your offer ignored doesn't feel good, right? Um, as tempting as it is to reject it unceremoniously, always encourage your sellers to answer the offer. Okay, fair enough. Um, you may want to uh, remind the sellers of the type of market they're in or what's typical, right? As we're going through these offers, if they're asking for closing costs, concessions, you might want to remind them that that's typical of this area. And we probably should have set them up for success during that listing appointment. If it's typical of the time that and the area that, hey, right now, you know, sellers are paying, buyers are kind of have this expectation that sellers are going to pay some of their closing costs or part of their rate buy down to keep the rate more manageable. We want to set them up for success in that. Also, when I put together the net sheet, I usually pad it with some repair costs so that when the buyers ask for some repairs, I can say, remember that net sheet that we saw at the beginning? I already padded it with $3,000 of repairs. So this actually will, you'll come out ahead. And then they're like, oh, okay, let's just agree to it and move on. Versus, oh, so that's that number that you gave me, it's another 3,000 or 5,000 off, right? So I always kind of prepare them in advance for these things. If it's typical that the seller pays for the home warranty, like let's set them up for success. Um. And remind them that our goal is a win-win, right? We want to help them get a win and help the buyers get a win. Um, so we need to negotiate um, in that way to move the transaction forward. Um, 
Oh, that last point where it talks about helps sellers understand price and terms, but not both, right? If it's, if <laughs> same thing with your buyers, help your buyers understand this. We talked about this. Uh, but if the buyer comes in, you know, 20,000 below asking and asks for another $10,000 in closing costs or ask for a 72 day close of escrow, <laughs> right? We may want to talk to the seller about what's more important, right? Is it, is it more important that we get this or that, you know, that happens, right? And we may want to even have a conversation with a buyer's agent and say, hey, your buyers are asking for something that's a little unreasonable. Like ultimately you're asking 30,000 below asking because we asked 20,000 below, we, the contract's 20,000 below what we were asking and then another 10,000 in concessions. What's more important to your buyers? Is the price more important or is the concessions more important, right? Where are we going to counter? And then we can have that same conversation with that offer re with our sellers, right? Hey, sellers, they came in way low at 30,000 below asking. Ultimately it's 20,000 off and then another 10. And I talked with the buyer's agent and those concessions are really important to the buyers. That's really good. They would rather pay more so we could, we could counter based on price, but it's really important to them to have that, that closing cost credit because they're going to buy the rate down, right? So we want to be able to have those conversations with our sellers and it's okay to have those conversations with the buyer's agents. Um, as you move through the sales process, you want to make sure you follow a checklist. I showed you my checklist um, at the very beginning of class. So you feel free to use that transaction flow sheet to kind of make your own checklist off of that. Hire a transaction coordinator. It's the best couple hundred bucks you're going to spend. We have one in the office. She's fabulous. Um, hire them. I do recommend that you know how to do everything on your own. You don't have to be an expert, but know how to navigate Skyslope and how to upload documents and um, how to send things out for e-signatures so that if something happens to your transaction coordinator, you're not dead in the water, but you don't have to do the work. Okay. Um, make sure that you communicate with your clients often during the phase of accepted contract to close. Daily communication is the norm. I would say, especially those first couple of weeks, you're probably going to have daily communication. You're going to be updating them on what inspections are scheduled. You're going to remind them that inspections are scheduled, the appraisal, when the appraisal is, when they should start packing, um, you know, how it's progressing along. You're going to update them on how the loan's going. You're going to send them over the documents that you get from the title company that they need to fill out. Um, so you're just going to kind of update them as the transaction wears on the daily communication doesn't necessarily need to continue it's you don't have anything to update, but we want to again set that expectation. Hey, there's not a whole lot we're already through the inspection time frame we've already talked about repairs there's not a whole lot going on this week. Um, I'll touch base with you on Monday if I don't have anything before then. Right. Or I'll touch base with you on Wednesday. We're going to set that expectation of when we're going to contact them next if it's not going to be on a daily basis. After you close the sale, we won't talk about all the muddy stuff that happens in the middle of the sale. Um, <laughs> after we close the sale, you want to talk about or think about like if you're going to send your seller a thank you gift, what that's going to look like. Um, and you know, what your tax write off is going to be versus a gift versus marketing, if it's branded and what all those things, think about all that. Also think about consistency in your closing gifts, right? Cause we don't want people to cry discrimination. So we want to make sure we have a systematic process for those closing gifts. And, um, I usually recommend same thing with your closing gift here, um, as with the buyers, you may want to wait a couple of weeks to deliver that closing gift. Maybe they've moved into a new house. Maybe they're in the process. Most sellers, like they're packing up, they're loading the truck and they're driving away at closing. They probably don't want your gift basket. Okay. They don't have room in their moving truck for your gift basket, unless maybe it's like road trip food. Right. So just think about that. And you may want to mail them something after they get settled in their new place. Right. Welcoming to the new home, wherever that might be or whatever that is. So just kind of keep that in mind and think about the process and what they've got going on. But um, oftentimes at closing, trying to also give them something becomes overwhelming. Some things that you can do during the transaction that would up your level of service. Go get some packing tape and some boxes, right? At some point, like after they remove all the contingencies, go deliver packing boxes and tape and be like, hey, like we're golden. Like we're moving right along. They've removed all their contingencies. Here's some stuff to help you along the way. Maybe, um, you know, once we enter into contract, 
and they're doing inspections, they may need like some wine or chocolate to get through that inspection time frame because sellers take that really stressfully um, because this is their baby. It's their house that they've lived in. And now people are going to come pick it apart. Right. So think about things that you can do throughout the transaction that may be more beneficial for a seller than a closing gift after the close of escrow. Right. Like little things along the way that help them know that the transaction's moving along and make it fun. Right. Our goal is to get referrals. We're going to ask for feedback. Right. How did I do? What could I do better? What did I do extremely well? You might have a survey that goes out with their closing paperwork that they fill out for you. And we want to use that rate my agent. We can send that out to collect referrals after the transaction is finished. Right. Super easy ways to get feedback. You want to make sure to also not only ask for feedback, but please ask for referrals. Who else do you know that needs my service? Okay. <clears throat> you want to make sure that you set them up in your CRM, your contact relationship manager. The free one that we have available to the, us is uh, <laughs> the one suite. I was like, I can't remember what it's called. Um, one suite. And then we also have Real Scout. I would set all of my sellers up on Real Scout for a monthly market update for wherever it is that they move to, right? Hopefully you're handling both transactions, either in the form of a referral, or you're helping them buy the next property, either way is a win. Um, but so we want to make sure we set them up for that after they get to their new location. And then we want to set them up in our CRM for those quarterly phone calls to make sure they're getting our monthly newsletter, to make sure whatever it is that we're sending out, that their anniversary's in there. Now we have a new home anniversary, that their birthday's in there, social media, right? That they're on those lists to do regular, regular systematic touches, even after the close of escrow. And please remember to update their address. They now have a new address. So please update their address. That's one thing that gets missed a lot. Um, that's all I got for today. Who's got any questions about the seller process? Was this helpful? Is anybody besides Heather still out there? Oh, I see people on yes. the internet. <laughs> Why do you doubt yourself? Everything you do is wonderful and very informative. <laughs> all right. What were some ahas? Any takeaways from today's class that you want to share? I think I had totally forgot that you had shared that before about the gifts going through the, you know, going through like and encouraging them through that. I think like I actually totally forgot about that because, you know, when you're newer, you're stressed too and you're not thinking about that. And then I do that, but now I'm like in another one and I'm like, oh yeah, like I need to remember to encourage them, you know, through it. Like it's okay. You like they're stressing about the, all the disclosures already. And I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, it's like, we're just beginning. Like, so I think that's really good. Um, I think that was really good reminder. While, for while you're thinking about your ahas, um, Abby put the attendance link in the comments box. So make sure you click on that and log your attendance. Uh, Lonnie said, thank you. It was very informative and she feels more confident. So that's a win. What other ahas? Todd, Kristen, Evelyn. Nope. We just have flies on the wall. Make sure I wasn't missing anybody. All right. Well, very good. It is 12 15. So I'm going to wrap up for now. You can rejoin me the same link today at four o'clock and we'll dive into those car forms additions that were added in um, December, as well as some of the forms that were updated in December. I'm going to try to like lump it all into one training, but uh, chances are we'll probably roll to next week. I'm just trying to prevent that. Um, so we'll be covering those today. I know for sure we're going to go over those new forms that were added in with the buyer representation agreement. There was a bunch of um, new forms that were added at that same time that are related to that form. So we'll be talking about those forms and then diving into the other ones as well. So uh, I look forward to seeing you all at four o'clock. Have a fabulous day and I'll see you tomorrow. I don't know what we're covering tomorrow. Tomorrow's, month, tomorrow's our monthly meeting. <laughs> Class tomorrow. We have no class tomorrow at 11 because we have the monthly um, huddle. <laughs> you were just testing us, right? I was. I was. So go to the monthly huddle. Thank you, Amy. Cool.
All right. Have a fabulous day. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.